enthusiasm is the electricity of life. How do you get it? You act enthusiastic until you make it a habit. Enthusiasm is natural. It is being alive, taking the initiative, seeing the importance of what you do, giving it dignity, and making what you do important to yourself and to others. Now that was a quote by Gordon Parks. And Gordon Parks is the artist that we are going to be studying today in art history. So Gordon Parks is one of the greatest photographers of the 20th century. He was a humanitarian with a deep commitment to social justice. He left behind an exceptional body of work that documents American life and culture from the early 1900s into the 2000s. With a focus on race relations, poverty, civil rights, and urban life. So together, today, we will dive deep into his life, his artwork, and his legacy. But here are three key terms that I want you to remember. They will come up through our conversation today. They represent Gordon Parks, and I just might test you on them in the end. Here they are. Photography activist, caption. So remember those three terms because here we go. We are diving deep into the life of Gordon Parks. Gordon Parks was born on November 30th, 1912 in Fort Scott, Kansas. He was the youngest of 15 children. He attended a segre segregated elementary school and was not allowed to participate in activities at his high school because of his race. Thus, and in numerous other ways, Parks experienced from an early age the sy systemic racism prevalent in American society. Parks was 14 when his mother died and a year later, he was sent to live in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, with his older sister and her husband. He lived with them for only a year. Uh, his brother-in-law kicked him out of the house. Parks recalls that man didn't like children and didn't want to take me on, and I sensed that the minute I walked into the house. So at the age of 15, Parks was forced to fend for himself. He initially considered his, continued his schooling at Central High School, but eventually dropped out before graduation. Eager to earn a living, he worked a number of jobs in different nightclubs around St. Paul and Minneapolis. He went on the road as a jack of all trades with a big band jazz troupe, occasionally sitting in on the piano. When the group disbanded in New York, Parks made his way to Harlem where he joined the New Deal Civilian Conservation Corps. He planted trees and builded campsites in New Jersey. He then returned, newly married to Sally Alvis, uh, to St. Paul and secured a job as a porter on the Northern Pacific Railroad. During his migratory years serving train travelers, Parks had access for the first time to picture magazines the passengers left behind on their journeys. After seeing a spread featuring the portraits of migrant workers, Parks bought his first camera at a pawn shop in Seattle, Washington during a train layover. He then taught himself how to take photographs. As his eye developed, he married his new talent with his ability to connect with people. And his anger about deep-seated issues he saw across in his travels around the United States. So Parks sought to photograph what mattered to him. The humane side of all people, 
no matter their race, ethnicity, gender, or religious beliefs. Parks remarked, I didn't start photography until about 1939. And up until that time, I worked as a waiter on the railway, bartended, played semi-professional basketball, semi-professional football, working in a brick plant, you name it, you know it, I did just about everything. So at 25, Parks continued to search for steady employment as photography increasingly became his obsession especially after seeing what the photographers from the FSA were doing with pictures of poverty, a subject he knew well. So the FSA uh, stands for the Farm Security Administrations, and that was an agency developed under the New Deal to combat rural poverty during the Great Depression in the United States. Now, Parks' move towards success in photography was quick and serendipitous. So he impressed a clerk at a local um, Kodiak shop here in Minneapolis uh, when he developed his first roll of film and this clerk encouraged him to work for a fashion magazine. His aptitude for fashion photography convinced Marilyn Murphy to give him the first opportunity to shoot fashion at her department store in St. Paul. From there, Park's reputation grew. He got a few more jobs taking photos for local newspapers. Then his big break, Marva Lewis, she was the wife of boxing champion Joe Lewis, saw Park's photos and was taken by his talent. She persuaded Parks and his wife Sally to move to Chicago, where Parks would predominantly take portraits of well-off society women. Upon arriving in the city, he immediately set up resident at the Southside Community Arts Center. They had a dark room. So he practiced there and participated in a lot of its activities. Now the Southside Community Arts Center was a branch of the Federal Art Project and this was established under the New Deal during the Great Depression. He befriended painter Charles White, sculptor Elizabeth Catlett, and writer Langston Hughes. He was also exposed to social realism reading and learning more during this time while continuing to take portraits for a little extra cash. So influenced by the South Side artist community, Parks began documenting the South Side ghetto. This documentary work formed the portfolio that Parks submitted to the Julius Rosenwald Fund. Uh, this was a fellowship program for talented young African Americans. And he was lucky. He won one of these coveted fellowships. Consequently, he wrote to Roy Steiker, an administrator of the FSA's historical division, and he asked to become a photographer at the unit, and he was accepted. So in 1942, just after the United States entered World War II, Parks moved his family to Washington, D.C. And his work with the FSA quickly put him on the map, making him one of the first high-profile black photographers working in America. Now, the FSA closed in 1943, so Parks became a freelance photographer. He published his first major photo essay in Life magazine in 1948. Now, this photo essay um, won Parks a lot of success, and he gained a position as the first African-American staff photographer for Life magazine. This was the most prominent illustrated magazine in the world at the time, and he got the job to work for it. Through his work 
For the magazine, Parks became known for his photo essays of poor Americans from the 1940s through the 1970s. He captured real life issues and people struggling with poverty, social injustice, and marginalization. As prolific and substantial as the platform was for Parks, he often ceded control over his photo essays when turning them into Life magazine. Parks realized early on that despite his own motives and narratives he hoped to capture in his photo essays, the picture editors at Life altered them. For example, in his first photo essay, Harlem Gang Leader, Parks aimed to highlight the humanity of Red Jackson and his fellow gang members, showing them as they were, teenagers who, with support of social service agencies, might be able to turn their lives around. However, as the photo historian Russell Lord noted, while the tone of the published photo essays was generally sympathetic to Jackson and the gang members, it emphasizes violence and slighted the potential for rehabilitation. Parks didn't like this. He didn't like the way they narrated his picture. So, as a way to gain control over his narratives, Parks insisted that he write the captions for his photographs. He did not want the magazine captioning his photos any longer. Now, at the same time, while he was covering the gang wars plaguing Harlem, Parks demonstrated his versatility and fulfilled some fashion assignments. Life's editor was pleased and he entrusted Parks with one of the magazine's key assignments. This was the French collections. Only after two years at Life and dozens of story under his belts, Parks began working out of the magazine's Paris bureau. So from 1950 to 1951, he would lead the life of the roaming photojournalist, experience acceptance and freedom as he traveled throughout Europe covering a host of stories. His ability to quickly move from shooting high profile actors, writers, aristocrats, politicians, to shooting average people living their everyday life is a testament to Park's ability to see all people as equal, each in their own right to have their story heard and seen. That was his mission in photography. He wanted to share the story of all everyday average people, rich, poor, young, old, black, white. He wanted to show the world them all. His assignments from 1956 to 1968 made him known for a sincere, direct, radical, and lyrical mode of photography. It is at this time he worked without a writer. Uh, he produced his own texts for stories um, of the pictures he was taking. Parks conceived many of his photo essays at this time as extended prominent profiles of black leaders and athletes. So he took photos of Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. And he excelled. He was really good at taking these portraits. And over the years, he went on to photograph different writers, composers, artists, actors, fashion designers, politicians, such as Robert Frost, Duke Ellington, Paul Newman, Richard Wright, and many, many more. He even photographed some debutantes and Social elites such as uh, Gloria Vanderbilt in 1954. So, Parks was very active, huh? Always taking photos, always working, 
and he remained active throughout his entire life, even up until his death from liver cancer in 2006. Along with his iconic photographs and films, Parks expanded his work, uh, moving from photography and film to include writing and composing. Now, cultural historian Maurice Berg noted, Park's transition to writing reflected a form of cultural activism, a realization that in order to cross the next barricade, he would have to tell his own story, that the war against racism, a problem he saw as complex and intractable, needed to be fought on multiple fronts through a range of media, context, and approaches. So, Parks realized, I can't just do this through taking photos. I gotta write, I gotta make film, I gotta use any media outlet I can to get my message to the people. Therefore, he became an author and he published a best-selling novel, The Leaning Tree, in 1963 which he later adapted into a film he wrote and directed in 1969. Um, the book and film, they are semi-autobiographical. Uh, he draws a lot of that from his childhood. So yeah, Parks was a busy guy, wasn't he? Mostly known for his photography, but later in life did dabble in filmmaking, writing, and yeah, he, he went the whole nine yards. So the legacy of Gordon Parks, what did he leave behind? Um, so Parks' work for Life Magazine has had a lasting impact on American cultural culture at large. Uh, his photographs not only serve as necessary documents of our country's history, but they also detail the lives of black families during this time. Nobody else really did that. So as such, his photographs gave a real life depiction of the conditions many black Americans experienced, influencing much of Life's magazine's readership. So predominantly, um, the people that read Life magazine were white and upper middle class. Well, Parks kind of shifted that. He opened that magazine up to more people in America. Now, later, Park's most lasting um, contributions outside of his photography practice was in his film. His films gave rise to an entirely new genre in filmmaking. Now, the film director Spike Lee, he considers Park's exceptionally influential not only in his technical ability, but also in the pure sense that Parks made the films he did during the time of severe racism, when there were no other black directors. He had nobody that looked like him doing what he was doing. He was the first one. So as Spike Lee points out, that was enough to inspire generations of black artists after Parks. Now today, the Gordon Parks Foundation continues to preserve Parks' work and makes it available for the public to see, admire, and gain inspiration from. It supports artistic and educational activities that advance Parks' purpose, which he described as the common search for a better life and a better world. So it continues to give scholarships, fellowships to other artists out there that want to continue spreading uh, his words for a better world. So, that's it. We swam through the life of Gordon Parks. Now, can you remember those three key terms I said in the beginning that I mentioned quite a few times through a conversation here? Can you remember? They are photography, activist, and caption. Now, it's time to put what we learned on to paper. I want you to grab your art journal, grab a piece of paper. I know you've got some scrap paper in your room. 
Grab anything. I have a small prompt that I want you to try. I want you to find a photo. Maybe you're going to look in a magazine, maybe in the newspaper. I want you to find a photo. Um, I found, well actually, somebody found this for me, but it was perfect. I found some photos in the newspaper of Duluth, which is where I'm from, so it really connected to me. I want you to find a photo in a newspaper, in a magazine, whatever, and I want you to tear it out. Or you can cut it out. Maybe you got scissors. Maybe you don't. Tear it out, okay? Tear out that photo. I want you to paste it into your journal. Paste it onto a paper. Uh, use tape, use glue, use whatever you have. Put it somewhere, and I want you to write a caption for it. So as I said, um, Gordon Parks took photos, but what made them powerful were the captions he wrote describing his photos, telling you why he chose that as his subject. So I want you to take any photo that resonates with you. It could be anything. It could be nature. It could be a person. It could be anything. And I want you to write a caption for it. It could be anything. Just give it a try. So that's your assignment today, everybody, to help um, keep what we learned about Jordan Parks. I want you to find a po photo, paste that in your journal, and write a caption for that photo. Have fun and be creative, okay? Now, I really hope that you enjoyed my art history talk today. I hope that um, learning about the life of Gordon Parks and his work brought you some joy. You learned something new and hopefully it inspires you in your artistic work. Now, may you all take care out there. Have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.